Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's uh, LJC event. Let me introduce myself. My name is Abby and I work with Barry Cranford, who's the founder of the LJC, and I have the privilege of hosting the event today. For those of you who don't know, the LJC is just one of the communities run by RecWorks. We currently run about 15 to 17 different tech communities, and the LJC is one of those. RecWorks are a tech recruitment company with a massive, massive difference. So as a company, we believe that recruitment really can be a force for good in the industry beyond just placing people in jobs. We have a particular focus on learning, mentoring and personal development. If people want to learn and others want to teach or share their knowledge, we are happy to connect you through our communities and events. We see this as giving back to those we've worked with in the past, but also paying it forward to those we hope to work with in the future. To date, we have run over 700 events for engineers and developers, students, graduates, CTOs. Uh, we've run conferences, lightning talks, hackathons, all sorts. In January of this year, we made our 4,000th introduction through our Meet a Mentor programme, and we're really looking forward to making that 5,000 introductions. As I've already said, we love to give opportunities for people to connect, and this event is part of that. If you would like to know more about any of our other communities, please do get in touch with myself, Barry or Helen Lewis, if you know her, and we can take it from there. The recording of today's session will be available for you on YouTube shortly, and I will put the link to the channel in the chat later on for you. Uh, as Vanessa speaks, we're so excited that she's here to come and speak to us tonight. As she uh, speaks, she has asked that we'll do a Q&A at the end. So if you think of anything that you want to ask, um, just make a note of it somewhere and then we will have time to open up the floor and you're welcome to unmute and ask your question or put it in the chat and I will ask it on your behalf. That's absolutely fine. And with no further ado, over to you, Vanessa. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Abby. And welcome, everybody. Hi, just give me a second to share my deck. There she is. Can you see my deck? I'm not in place. Okay, thumbs up. I think so. Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, I hope you had a good day. As, uh, as I said, I'm Vanessa Janikola. My pronouns are she and her. And today I'll be talking about TDD and other drugs, or in other ways all the ways in which us as technology look at quality as a magic pill that can solve all our problems and maybe there are other ways we could look at it. I will progress. So for some people it's important to see the agenda of the talk so you have an idea of where I'll, um, what I'll be talking about. So I'll first give you a background on me and discuss a few key issues I've encountered along the way. This is to give you some context of where my opinion, uh, opinions come from. Then I will address the concept of holistic quality, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with some conclusions. So just to give a little bit of context uh, on me, so I have a quite conventional background of a computer engineering degree, and then I, but I took in Italy, and then I took a master's degree in London. After that, I started working as a software engineer. I am a software engineer by trade. And I first worked for Read Business and Information, then I moved to Microsoft, and then I worked for ThoughtWorks for quite some time, worked in three different countries, two different offices. And now I work as an engineering manager for Flow, which is a company whose mission is to improve the well being of women and girls all over the world. And this is to give you some context of the journey of the various activities. So in ThoughtWorks, my last role was technical leader, so I was leading teams. So over this period of time, I've actually worked in multiple different domains, um, whether it was fintech a couple of times, um, government, editorial, communication, health tech a couple of times too. And there I worked on multiple tech stacks. Tech stack. So whether it was with .NET, Java, whether it was JavaScript, whether it was some Go, I, to different extents at different points in time, I've probably worked with quite a significant number of uh, programming languages. And in time, I developed, you know, full stack development skills, 
maybe a bit less on some aspects. Definitely, I've done a lot of backend and infrastructure, spent quite some time doing architecture, uh, also architecture assessments, uh, cloud analysis, um, CI, CD improvements. And I think what's particularly significant for the purpose of this conversation that we're having is that I worked as a consultant and software developer in delivery, let's say. So on one end, I have experience with delivery. On the other, is I used to go to clients and assess their you know, technical capabilities, delivery capabilities, skill set, help them, coach them, grow them towards uh, the objective they wanted to deliver, which put me in the interesting position of having an overview of both how to, uh, what kinds of challenges people have and actual the day-to-day -day challenges of delivering myself. Now, this is significant because what I found in the multiple uh, places I've worked is that although the context was fairly different, as I showed you, you know, quite a plethora of difference, the problems were fairly similar. And I found myself having the same conversation over and over with people. So then these are some of the problems that I've encountered over and over. First of all, insufficient testing. So insufficient testing is as common as you, I think it's hard to imagine how, how common this is. So I very, very rarely found a code base which had the, a level of testing that would confidently allow anyone to just change any line of code and progress with, um, little worry. Low quality tests, again, very, very common. And by that, I mean the fact that the um, test code is not of the same quality level of the production code. And that is extremely common. Another common thing is the unclear test definition. I've literally heard a different definition of the integration test in each team I have worked in. And I think it, what we find is that this very wide um, ranges of definitions for tests is because there's a lot of confusion around it. And then in general, this engaged attitude towards testing, where testing is always like a second class citizen for many people. And there's many more, but I think these are some of the most significant. So usually I've found that there are usually uh, developers divide in two main categories. There's either the ones that are completely addicted to testing, you know, the ones with a little heart, like I would be, uh, I can define myself. So they love their tests, they test, they test, they're, you know, they wouldn't see, you know, they, they wouldn't see themselves doing any features without the test. And then there's the other category, which I don't think anyone these days and age would say I hate testing, but I think there's some, that sense of kind of bored hostility of not quite yet understanding the value of it or embracing the value of it or just not having the same level of interest in it. And this for me bubbles up to at the end of the day, people being a bit confused about why, when, what should they do. So I've had many conversations about about what should be tested, when should it be tested, why should I do that, and so on. So to me, this falls under the, why would I even care about quality? And you know, usually the, the answers to this would be, you care about quality because you want your code to do what's expected, plain and simple. And I mean, I'm pretty sure there's nobody in the room or anyone else that would say, no, I don't want my code to do what I expect it to. And then everybody wants to make changes to the code base that are cheap and quick. So nobody wants to have to in, you know, invest I don't know, months to make small changes. Nobody wants to invest you know, an army of developers to make small changes. And unfortunately for me, and, and this is quite trivial, there's not many other ways around it. So if you want your code to work as expected, you need to have tests that guarantee that your feature does not get changed in a way that you don't expect. And if you want your code to be flexible to change, it has to have high quality. And with that, I don't mean exclusively, uh, you know, number of tests. Uh, some people equate the word quality with just the test, you know, in a more broader sense. So your code base needs to have um, very readable code. It needs to be well designed. It needs to be extendable. And this is true for both your test code and your production code. So then this leads us to who's Responsibility is policy. So 
Although I am a firm believer that quality is everyone's responsibility, the same way as shipping product is everyone's responsibility, I do think that only one job role has in their definition to write good quality code, and those are the developers. So if I were to point out the responsibility of um, good quality code and you know good tests, I would actually attribute it to developers and only to developers because they know best how to write the best code, code quality. Now, if you have software engineering tests, same difference. I mean, the developer skill set is the people with the developer skill set should be taking care of your um, of your software. Now, and this is again for quite a, for a quite simple concept, which is test code is just code. I'm I'm still I still find myself surprised in conversation of how people discuss test code as it's something else. When people say test but not code. At the end of the day, it's all just code. You still have to you know, write it, has to follow the same uh, rules. It will have to compile. It works exactly like regular code. And this is not a small concept. I think it's something that's often overlooked. So let's try and embrace now um, the concept of holistic quality. And I don't think many people look at it that way. So when we talk about holistic, what I mean is, so this is, you know, clear references uh, from dictionaries. So when we talk about holistic, about holistic um, aspects in general, we refer to something that is characterized by the belief that the parts of something are intimately interconnected and inexplicably, um, and we can't, you can't refer to them if not in a group. And even the concept of holistic medicine helps us in this journey of this conversation, because when we look at holistic medicine, what we think of is how to address a disease, not only looking at the symptoms of the illness, but also looking at all the social human aspects that actually um, surround the person that might be afflicted by the disease. It's a way of looking at problems and the concepts which is wider and more complex than single parts. And this is the kind of mindset that I would like you to uh, be in to start thinking about quality. So, what is holistic quality? So quality for me is not something that can be compartmentalized. We need to approach it holistically from all key software delivery factors. So, and this takes us to these three dimensions. So the architecture dimension, the code dimension, and the people dimension. And there are, so we'll carry on deep diving into these various aspects and uh, try and discuss a little. So let's start with architecture. So there are many definitions for architecture. This is the one I chose to use for the purpose of purpose of this conversation and this topic. So I refer to architecture as the set of all the components and their relationships that together deliver a service to a client. And I look at it from a components perspective, technology perspective, and infrastructure perspective. So it's multidimensional, but it maybe simpler from some other aspects. And what I usually do is what I refer to as a quality threat modeling. So some of you might be familiar with the exercise of um, threat modeling. Uh, if you're not, what ha a threat model is an exercise that usually is performed with a security expert and a development team. And it could just be the developer or development team if they are so uh, inclined and competent for it. And looking at the architecture of a system, uh, you analyze what are the areas that potentially could be attacked in a way or another, and you identify potential mitigations on how this could be improved. And I believe the same concept could be applied to quality in general. So I will present four different steps that I usually follow to try and uncover the quality strategy for a system or the gaps. So first thing of all that I would do is identify your existing test pyramid. So if I join a new team, I will uh, maybe run an exercise and talk to people to identify all the different types of tests that the, that team has. What, what's the definition of each of those tests? What's the distribution of those tests? When would they use them? What percentage of them we have? 
what's the sense of gap of them, and build a test pyramid that represents the current state. Often it doesn't look like a pyramid. If people are not familiar with the concept of the test pyramid, test pyramid is a concept where we uh, identify all the types of tests that might be necessary and we identify in order the ones that have higher cost compared to lower cost compared to value. So for example, in this diagram, what is usually recommended in general is like low cost tests, like unit tests, you have more of, and high cost tests like UI, which have very high value, but they're very expensive, you have a few less. What often happens when you um, analyze the uh, distribution of tests of a team is that it doesn't quite look like a pyramid, but it's a good way of addressing it. So point one would be for you to have a deep understanding of the current situation. Then second thing would be to, given your architecture, map your architecture multidimensionally. Again, you know, the services, what storage, the queues, identify if there is a difference between your architecture conceptually and your implementation infrastructurally, because often there is where you'll find some risks. And then draw the communication between components. Often I do it through a use case. Like I take the most relevant use case and I run it through. So there's also some dynamicity in the diagram. And technology information is relevant, but I usually do it at the end. So it's more relevant to understand their services talking through a database or a relational database or another type of database than that it is implemented in SQL Server, for example. There are some quirks that come from specifics of the uh, technology, but I would say it's like a, a later concern for me, at least. And then there's a third aspect, which is once you have, you know, you have the existing knowledge of the your policy distribution, you have a good view of your current architecture multidimensionally. Then at that point, you actually start the equivalent of the threat modeling, so the quality threats and mitigations. Identify what you think should be tested within the architecture and start discussing with your team how you would test it. What would, do you need box services? Uh, what kind of test would you use? How would that test be? And so on and so on. And sometimes there will be patterns, so maybe different services will be tested in a similar manner. So you have a similar um, pyramid there, but maybe between services you'll have different implementations. So it's all to be discussed. And at that point, what you do, you build your desired pyramid. You say, okay, so I would like my system to look this way. So then what you can do is actually identify the delta between the two and prioritize what would give you a better impact first and start, and start building a map in time. Because I assume that often there are gaps and not many people will have the capacity to just uh, solve it all. So again, the skill of prioritization is always important even in, in this case. So this is a small recap for the quality threat modeling. So identify your existing pyramid, map the architecture of your system on the test multidimensionally, identify the quality threats and the mitigation plan and mitigate quality threats. So let's move to the next one. Okay. So code and software practices. So by code and software practices, I mean all the code characteristics and soft practices that contribute overall to code quality. And I'll bring up a few points that I think are interested, interesting from this point of view. So I am a firm believer that you need to test everything that you want to work. Like if you want to make sure that something works, I don't know any other way than actually test it, make sure there's some automation tests. When I mean test, I always mean software. Um, you, I, my recommendation would be to build your test code with your production code together, favoring writing tests first. I'm a big, big fan of TDD. Um, but in general, even just the mindset of thinking of the, you know, your strategy for testing with your strategy to build your feature is going to help you build a feature that's testable. And also test all aspects. If there is a security concern or a risk, put a test there to make sure that if you change the code, that wouldn't be exposed somehow. Same for infrastructure, same for performance, and so on. Another aspect, and again, this comes from empirically from my experience, so that this is not a strict metric, 
is that I found that the best code bases I've worked on, the ones that were most of the times fully TDD'd from beginning to end, tended to have 80% um, test code compared to a 20% product of code. Meaning that your test code is actually the greatest majority of your code base, which means that it's a lot of code to maintain. And you just need to find efficient ways to create it and maintain it. There's no, uh, there's not many options around that. If you have a lot of test code, test code will degrade the same way as your production code will probably. And you might want to make sure that you can support it uh, the best way possible. So again, TDD, I'm sure everybody is familiar with TDD in one way or another. Uh, I will walk you through some key concepts just to give you that uh, round of view and also how I look at it. So I look at TDD as the technique where my test code is suggesting or telling me how my production code should behave. Similar to how you see this little girl with red hair talking to the little girl with brown hair. The idea is I'm making a suggestion of how it should be, and then that's how it behaves. Similar to how your production code and test code work together, as you see all the birds on, on the right, you know, just fly in the same direction. And although people do it in slightly different ways, this is what I usually consider as a reference. So clean codes, three rules of TDD, where it says, you may not write production code until you have written a failing unit test. That is quite significant. It, mean, it means, again, your test code is telling you how to build your production code. You may not write more than a failing unit test that is sufficient to fail, not compiling is failing. That means that you have to control quite strictly what you write in your test. You can't write the entire feature in your test and then try and make it pass. You have to gradually build your test code and your production code together. So this is saying write the minimum that will allow you to break the code and then loop again. You may not write more production code that is sufficient to pass your current fighting test. But this rules, repeated over and over clearly, allow you to build that loop of um, small increments, change, small increments, break, red, green, refactor, and so on. And this is a very natural way, I find, to uh, make sure that you have the level of, of um, quality safety that you expect, that you would want. Um, I found that if people are not uh, familiar with TDD, it takes a bit to get into the habit of it. And I think it takes even longer to truly appreciate the value of it. Most of the time in my experience is because people who have not done TDD don't necessarily build the same test that the people who do TDD build. So the expectation is a bit different. And if they were to write afterwards all the tests that are generated from TDD, they probably prefer TDD. So if this is a journey that you want to undertake, you have to take it as something that you learn in time and you need to be a little patient with it at the beginning. But I would recommend it highly. So another aspect that I consider is uh, to treat your test code the same way as your production code. As I mentioned before, test code is uh, code. So I think the same rules that you use for production code should be used. So clean code rules and good design rules should go all the way in your test code as much as in your production code. Avoid duplication, reuse what you can. I usually have various helpers, domain objects in my test code. Uh, design based on domain, again. I try and make them performant. Um, nobody, no development team wants to run tests that are, are slow. It just doesn't happen. They will leave them behind. Um, so you might have invested a lot, but then they become too slow and then nobody runs them. So, you know, fails the term on your investment. Um, consider the best helper concepts so and libraries. So the same as you would do with your software, make sure that you identify when there is some helper, there are maybe some uh, libraries that help you uh, generate uh, data, for example, at times or others. Um, Make sure the tests are independent from each other. Like this is something that often happens that then the tests tend to depend on each other. This will hinder your progress in time because you will have um, false positives and you know, you're gonna take ages, scrapping ages to figure out what's wrong. 
Um, invest in great data setup. So the difference between having great data setup and having set up data every time uh, is the difference between having a couple of tests or something and having you know as many as you want. Because when you do a little investment in set up data setup at the beginning, you find that you can write as many tests as you want afterwards because the effort of setting up the data is usually quite big. And in general, just to the test code the same as you would your production code. Just flow them together. Then we have the path to production. I refer to the path to production as the set of practices and hopefully automated uh, steps that takes your software from inception to production. Now, why is it relevant in the context of quality? It's because you see a path to production as a pipeline of incremental value and as a promotion steps, uh, structure. And your tests are there to promote your build from one step to another of the path to production until it's considered appropriate to be seen by your users. So understanding when to put which test and how it's quite significant for your overall delivery. And then we go to this interesting aspect, which I think is often overlooked, which is people. So I tend to look at my team and the software as one system, because I believe the software is an expression of the people who wrote it. And I do think that the two um, interact quite closely. Um, a team that works on legacy code base will interact with it in a different way that they would interact with some greenfield they're building. The dynamics between individuals might be different. So I like to think of it as one system. And I like to think about how I can support the entire system overall. And I think when we talk about people, we need to understand what's behind the low quality in software that um, is part of the code base. And we need to look at it from a people's perspective, like what motivated them uh, to do or not do something, what didn't motivate them, why didn't they see value in it, were they not allowed to do it, did they not understand it, is it a skill, is it a preference, uh, did they maybe discover an alternative way, but it's important to understand that human beings make decisions based on how they feel about things and that's something to consider. So I've read this very interesting book uh, maybe a couple of years ago now, which is called Drive from Daniel Pink, I would highly recommend that. Uh, among the many interesting things that they, he suggests in this book, there is uh, there are three points that he considered, considers key intrinsic motivators to increase performance in individuals. So at the core of this is how can we make um, a career help people be more performant? Um, the theory is that if they're more motivated, they will be more performant, and that the motivation technique he um, claims should be intrinsic. So individual from the individual. So the three key points here are purpose, autonomy, and mastery. By purpose, we mean people like to wake up at the morning and feel that what they do all day has a meaning. For them, for society, it can be different, but it has to make sense to them at the personal level. Then there is autonomy, which is the desire to be able to be the master of one's destiny so that when you have a task, you can deliver you can deliver it independently and you're not micromanaging all aspects. So you have that sense of creativity and autonomy that is gratifying. And then the third one, which I think is the most relevant in the context of this conversation, which is mastery. The desire to feel that you're getting better at something and that you're, you're mastering a technique, you're mastering a job. So you are building those skills that are making you um, strong at it. So why is this relevant? So I do believe that we should leverage the mastery aspect to encourage people to build better, maintain better, do more task code in a just just higher quality test code. Um, if we could convey how incredibly challenging it can be to build systems that are properly tested, if we consider that 80% of your code is actually test code, 
isn't it meaningful to make sure that you that, that code is as good as it can possibly be, as flexible, as performant, as sophisticated? So to me, knowing how to appropriately test code is a, it's a very sophisticated software engineering practice. And if we could convey to people that that is the case, we might have better results in general. So how can we try and, and do that? So one aspect is communicate, so making sure that people are aware, especially for our technical leaders, that the company, your manager, your team, the industry values this skill set, values this contribution is important for the company, that you would be considered a stronger, more developed, more mature developer if you master the skills, and make sure that this is recognized too. So that people, there's some sense of positive reinforcement in the system for maybe teams that uh, encourage more that kind of behavior towards another. So we change the mindset towards it. What I found is that for many people, testing wasn't a priority because maybe the managers didn't recognize it such and that it was a chain of dependencies that brought that kind of mindset. So to conclude, There is no magic pill for good quality. You know, TDD is not gonna save you. Um, best test library is not gonna save you. Um, we, how I would recommend to look at it is more holistically. Just approach it from whether your architecture is supporting it, whether you, you've understood all the different layers and complexity of the test, whether your actual test code is helping or should be improved, and also whether your engineers and managers and in general, like everybody involved in the process, actually value that. So given that is the large majority or should be the large majority of the code that you are changing daily. And again, to go through the three pillars to make sure that all those are, are um, uh, satisfied at some level. And um, these are some resources. Now, I'm sure many other books have contributed to these ideas of mine, but I think these were particularly, particularly significant. So clean code, because it's a manual on how to write a good code, and that applies to test code and production code. Accelerate, because it's probably the best book on software delivery I've ever read. And it helps you understand how what's critical and what is significant for the overall picture. Drive, which I mentioned before, which is about individuals, teams, how to motivate them. Working effectively with legacy code is a great book to um, learn how to refactor legacy code. And although there are many concepts, there's one key one that stayed with me since I read it maybe 10 years ago, which is you should write tests before you refactor any of your code. And uh, Michael Feathers mentions many, many, many different techniques to do this. But at the end of the day, the suggestion is to write tests before you even refactor. Imagine even more clearly when you write it a new one. And then there's Ikigai, which is not a textbook. Uh, Ikigai is a Japanese concept where they believe that the secret of a happy life is finding activities which are the intersections of multiple of your interests, whether it is things that, you know, um, support you, things that make you happy, things that, you know, you can do longer in life, things that reward you emotionally in a different way, is finding, is understanding that life is complex and multidimensional, and that we need to look for the intersections of what will work, because linear thinking doesn't quite work in uh, problem solving for complex problems like life and software quality. So this is pretty much it. So I'm happy to take questions if you want to. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Thanks. Vanessa. That was really cool. Really great to hear from you. Thank Does you. anybody have any questions? We're getting some lovely comments in the chat saying thanks for a really great talk. How kind. Currently no, currently no questions at all. I love it. I mean, I love it. I love it when there's oh, no you questions. Being really nice. I see lots of thank yous. 
I see somebody saying about the 80-20 how. So that, that is completely empirical. How much effort does it take to <laughs> I'd see a couple of questions. Mm, yeah, they're coming up now. So yes. <laughs> how much oh, effort it. does it take to maintain 80% of code? So let's start with the first one. So to me, it's 80% 80 is a complete um, empirical number. So there's no you know, scientific foundation. Is, and it is my perception over the years. I find that, and if anyone of you in the room has ever practiced TDD, for um, a method of five lines, you will probably have, you tend to have for each method, I don't know, at least six different um, tests. They'll probably ha also have at least three lines, you know, a setup, um, exercise, and insertion. Um, it's probably more complex than that. If you do the math on that, it turns out to be roughly that. Now, again, it's perception, so the numbers are not precise. The point is for a feature, there are multiple combinations. You will have to have multiple tests, and that's how it builds up. My ideal scenario is a scenario where I remove any line of code in the code phase, and I have two tests failing, no more than that. A unit test that is telling me that the uh, specifics, you know, details of that features are broken and an end-to-end -end test at some level, you know, end-to-end -end test in a broad uh, way that tells me that my functionality will not work because that line of code was essential. So the idea is that you look at micro and macro and to do that and do it appropriately, you need a significant coverage. And by the way, I do not believe in um, test uh, coverage tools, and this is very controversial, I understand that. To this day, I've not found one test coverage tool that actually represents the equivalent of a TDD approach. In fact, if you if you meet um, TDDers, most TDDers don't look at um, test coverage. From that. So how much effort it takes to maintain it, the same effort that it takes to maintain the entire code base. Uh, I think uh, you probably want to, in any case, have smaller code bases, you know, microservices approach, maybe if that's for you. Um, I, I could flip the question and say, how long does it take to fix a bug when you don't have test to catch it, right? It's like, uh, unfortunately, it is an effort, uh, but that's the effort that makes you quicker, I think. Uh, let's see. Fantastic. Other so how much logic do you tolerate in tests? And when is test code complicated enough to need its own tests? What a good question. Um, I find that if the design of your code is simple enough, your test will follow. So if your test is so complex or it has so many combinations that it's out of hand, for me, that is what I would call a smell of your class being too big. So it means that it's doing too many things. If you, you know, you're diligently trying to test everything, you end up with 20 scenarios and, you know, full algorithms to test it. It means that your class is too big. So either two things, you're testing more than one class together, which I wouldn't recommend, or your class has too many responsibilities. You want to split the class and split the test. But th that would be my tell. It's like, this is a bit more co too complex, probably has too many responsibilities split. Excellent. Um, the next question we have had in says, um, writing, uh, please forgive my pronunciation, JUnit, JUnit tests first will fail com compilation if the classes have not been written yet that's it that's yes. how it's phrased does that make sense yes, to so, you as a question <laughs> so for me right so what i do when i do tdd right so for example let's say i am writing a chair class right it's called chair i will have a chair test i will write the chair test file first it will only have the according to whichever language I'm using, it will just have, you know, the, the, the framework pretty much and, you know, the, the class definition and the method. 
and then it will say new chair class in some way, I'm putting it into language, and that file will not exist, so my code will fail. And then I'll probably use some, you know, nice kind of refactoring auto tool that will, you know, right click and auto generate my class and then it will pass. And then I will go back to my task and maybe call a method on that class that won't exist. It will not compile again. I will then again, probably auto generate it, have, a, you know, a, a method that probably throws an exception. You know, then it will run, throw exception, fail. So I will have to make it pass and so on and so on until I never actually intentionally written anything in my production code that my tests have not forced me to write. And it's quite strict at the start, but you know, that's, it really like, I, so I've tried both ways. I started as a TD, actually, I started not knowing any of this in university, then I started working and I, I, I was taught and I thought this was fantastic. And then I went to a different job where it wasn't as common and I tried not to do it because there was lots of pressure not to do it. And the result was that my expectation for the number and quality of tests was so high that not doing it in a TDD manner was so much more work than doing it in a TDD manner because that's a flaw. And, and so I went back to my first love. So we've also had a question about starting a new project. Um, so what about starting a new project where test coverage is very low? What is the best approach to improve that? So I would encourage to always look at features. Like I, I see a feature, when I say feature, I mean how I test it and the feature, always together. So if you're doing that consistently in time, it doesn't quite matter where you started from, if that makes sense. So if it's legacy, you probably need to invest in covering that because you probably can't change the code. But if it's new code, right? I it doesn't it doesn't matter to me what percentage you know you have at that point in time. It's more about the principle than the number. If you trust that anyone can change that line of code without a line of code and you know a test will fail, then you've succeeded. That's your objective. Like tests are not something you scatter around, I consider it like a passport. So for me, at unit test level, for example, every class has a passport, which is their test. The first thing I do with a code base, I open the tests, because the test should tell me what the system does. I don't know if that helps. I, I hope it will. <laughs> I'm sure it will. I'm sure it does. We've got some more questions coming in as well. So um, you sort of touched on this earlier, but do you prescribe a minimum percentage in relation to code coverage? So the problem is I don't believe that the test coverage tools provide the same information as the actual coverage. So most test coverage tools uh, tell you whether there is a test that has a pass through your code and that doesn't tell me all the nuances of it and it often is also quite easily gameable so I, i'm not saying ditch the um test percentage but don't take it as like a small component of your understanding of whether your code is properly tested or not focus so again my test is i go and remove a line of code and i see what breaks I'm not suggesting you do this, you know, clearly you want to add your automation, but that is a better test to tell you whether your system is tested than anything else. Try a few times and see whether it always fails or if it doesn't, because I've tried it in many places and it didn't fail. And really, if you can remove a line of code but nothing fails, what does it tell you? Can you trust it? Mm, interesting. I like it. Um, so our next question, uh, with, a, with a little bit of background as well, um, mm -hmm. as we all know, developers and analysts or product owners work closely together and developers get the requirements from the analyst product team. Do you think the developer is responsible for figuring out all the test cases? If not, how should others be involved in that process? This is a hard question because it requires a bit of context. So let me try. 
So I think the user stories should have your edge cases and all your all your use cases there. But I think a developer is responsible for doing that also, as in from a business perspective, your edge cases should be represented in your story for sure. And but when you're writing your your feature, if you're testing it, you know, test driving your your code, you will not be able to build it if you don't actually cover your scenarios. So there's different aspects and different projection. And I think that of six use cases, maybe for each use case, you'll find more edge uh, cases in your code because you will probably have multiple classes and those classes will have their own validations and concerns. And I think that's developer's responsibility, but you should start with some good solid use cases at the start. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I don't know how we're doing for time. How are we doing? Oh, we've got plenty of time, lovely. Um, and our next question in the chat um, says, how much upfront design thinking or architecture would you do before TDD? Um, they've said, you know, my understanding is TDD is a mindset or a change in mindset to write tests after functional or production code. And it's more like to question oneself first and start very small with the few things and then evolve with required quality. Um, what's, what's your thinking? What's your take on that? So I think when we talk about architecture at the level of systems, a microservice, a queue, a database, architectural elements, then I, in abstract, I wouldn't call it TDD. I think about how am I going to test this for sure. But that's not TDD. It's kind of like um, that kind of test first mindset. I think when I look at the service, I think if the service is brand new, you probably want to rely first on, you know, are you using some framework? Yeah, it's an MDC framework. So sometimes there's already some patterns. So if, it's an, if there is an existing code, code base, you probably want to look at the existing structure. Many code bases, I'm trivializing here, so allow me, will have some sort of controller that receives the information. There will be some sort of mapper, transformer that will transform the request in an object of some sort. There will be some service that will make some requests, that will process it. There will probably be some data store that will be asked for something in the meantime, transformed, retransformed back, and then it goes back. This structure, I think you, I think, uh, you know, I wouldn't be that strict as to say, don't have a think through of how you would do it. Um, some of these are pretty standard, you know, a controller, a service, but this said, I always let the test guide me. So let's say I have mentally an understanding, a little drawing that I think, you know, I'm going to have a controller, a service, and some query class. At that point, what I would do is start with the controller. And when I start seeing that I have too many responsibilities, probably I will um, create some transformer that is transforming my web object in a domain object. And it's like, oh, that's a tell. And I open up. And, and start another class and do that. So you're gonna have to let your test guide you too. Again, it takes a little experience, um, but I don't think it's either never do some you know, whiteboard design or do pure TDD. I think that it's not do, don't build the code without having written the test first, if that makes sense. So, and also listen to your code, like your test, when it becomes painful to test, you know that your class is too big, that you haven't mocked it appropriately, that you're testing multiple classes, like your tests are going to tell you the smells in design. Fantastic. So um, I just have a final question that's um, come up in the chat as well, which you again may have uh, touched on already. So forgive me if you have. Um, do you recommend cross or different skills team pair uh, team pair program? Sorry, with TDD. Yes. So I'm a big fan of pair programming. I've 
had the privilege of working with the pair programming way for many years. And by pair programming, I mean the discipline of consistently working as a pair. And by that, I mean from eight to six hours a day and to be core responsible for the feature at all points in time. It's not occasionally we collaborate. It is a consistent system for the entire team working in the same way and rotating with almost the same cadence. So to build um, that resilience in the system in knowledge share. So I'm quite strict when I repair to that for one. And I value extremely that people with different seniorities pair together because they learn different things, completely different things. And yes, more senior people learn from more junior people, 100%. And I, people, independently from their seniority, just they have different experiences, different ways of working, will see how the others work, so even peers. And if you are, you know, maybe used to more front-end than back-end, and somebody's used to more back-end, I would even more make them pair together because there's that level of understanding that you build on how to interact. If you're, you know, if human beings can learn how to interact, or you think that your software is going to be better at interacting. So all the way. Brilliant, thank you. Do we have any final questions? I will take that as a no. So that all that is left for me to say this evening is, um, I've just put the YouTube channel and my LinkedIn profile in the chat. If you want the recording of this evening's talk and Q&A, um, please do find it on the YouTube channel or message me and I can send it to you. Um, thank you so much, Vanessa, for coming and sharing what my you know pleasure. Um, and, and being willing to um, answer all those questions for us as well. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. It's been great to see you all again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next LJC event. Thank you. Have a great evening. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>